Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and today our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, has a fascinating study for us as the Bible bus rolls up to Leviticus chapter 25. But before we get started, here's a letter that Dr. McGee shared many years ago. I have a letter today to let you hear the contents of it, that is, of most of it, and it will be self-revealing, so I'll read the letter. The change started in me back in 1982 as a result of, or at least related to the loss of a job and separation from my wife. At that time, I had a glimpse of myself as a most unsavory character although the term sinner was not then in my vocabulary. During some hard times and encounters with a range of kind and not-so-kind people, I had been interested in various religions and psychological concepts, but had never experienced the most important part, the feeling. After a year of separation... I somehow reunited with my wife and family. I got a good job. It was during the morning drive to work that I accidentally tuned into your radio broadcast through the Bible. You were in Habakkuk. I had almost no knowledge of the Bible, but an intellectual curiosity made me listen the next day and then the next until the curiosity deepened into consuming passion for your program and my singular focus on Christ as my personal Savior. In my contemplation of him and his life, the intensity of his truth made the truths of other religions seem like entertaining, hard-earned wisdom or semi-hypnotic, mystical word games. To be sure, there are some truly honest, dedicated humanists who propose a Christian life using different verbal terms, but them, they leave out Christ, so their proposals can never be affected. This is strange talk coming from me, a 43-year-old Jewish computer manager. It is not easy for me to act out my salvation among the people who know me. To the unsaved, a new Christian is a disturbing figure, like a cat suddenly starting to bark. It's your radio program that spins me in my morning church of the Oldsmobile. I listen to other Christian broadcasts when I can, read the scriptures and their commentary, read books, but your program is still at the center. Sometimes I disagree with your interpretation to the point where I almost shout at my dashboard. Other times I am profoundly in debt to you for an insight that I know will last me forever. Never are you unstimulating or do you lose your vital connection to Christ. And I appreciate that letter so very, very much because... That's what we want the Through the Bible Radio to do for people. Even after Dr. McGee went home to be with the Lord, we've continued his great tradition of reading your letters. And in fact, December is Letter Month here at Through the Bible. It's a special time that we set aside to ask for your stories and rejoice in God's work in all of our lives. So email us at BibleBus at ttb.org or send your note to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C 6B1. Let's pray as we open God's Word together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the grace that you'll show us today. Thank you that you provide for our needs before we even know that we've got them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now we've come in chapter 25 to the laws relating to the promised land, the sabbatic year, the year of jubilee, and the redemption of property and person. This is a very interesting chapter in many ways and throws added light on a phase and feature of the law and of the land that we'd not get anywhere else. 
You see, not only was the Mosaic economy directed to the people of Israel, but it also pertained particularly to the land of Palestine. I wonder if you've ever thought of that. Great many people talk about, well, the Mosaic law was given to the nation Israel. Fine. But it was also geared to that land. And I think you'll find that emphasized in this chapter. The laws given here could not be enforced until Israel entered the land of Canaan, and they could not possibly be adapted to the wilderness. And, well, it wouldn't fit into California, I don't believe. And they don't fit into other areas of our nation. Now you'll notice that God says here, and watch for it to occur, when you come into the land, rest under the land, proclaim liberty throughout all the land. And you will find out that that occurs 10 times in this chapter, which means it's pretty important. And the words that are on the liberty bell are found in this chapter here. And you look for them. It's difficult, by the way, to read Leviticus as well as the entire Bible without noticing the recurrence of the number seven. The number seven is not a perfect number, as some like to think of it. Some think it denotes perfection. I think that there is a distinction there that may not be a difference, but it needs to be made. It is a number that denotes completeness, not always perfection. There is a definite connection, I think, of this in the book of Leviticus and in the book of Revelation. And both of these books use it in a structural way as We've seen a recurrence of it, the seventh day, the seventh week, the seventh month, the seventh year, and the seventh, seventh year, which would be the sabbatic year, and so on. So we have, first of all, the sabbatic year here. And will you notice there is a scale that, in fact, I've made a series of circles where you have the Sabbath day, the seventh week, the seventh month, the seventh year, and the seventh sabbatic year. And that would be the year Jubilee. All of that all goes together in one package. I have it in my second volume on Leviticus, which, by the way, we probably should begin to talk about now as we're about to complete the book of Leviticus. Now, let me read it, verse 1 and 2 here of the 25th chapter of the book of Leviticus. And the Lord spoke unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, and we go back now to Mount Sinai. Why? Well, you couldn't put this into effect in Mount Sinai. It's to be in effect when they get in the land. Verse 2, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Now, this is amazing. Here is a Sabbath for the land as well as for man. The seventh day is for man and the seventh year is for the land. That's interesting. And rest in these verses means literally keeping of a Sabbath, by the way, where in Hebrews, God says in chapter 4, verse 9, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, for he that is entered into his rest. And that means into the keeping of a Sabbath. What kind of Sabbath? This is redemption rest hasn't anything in the world to do with the day here. He also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Now, we come here to the fact that letting the land lie fallow every seventh year did the land good, and it also was good for the vineyards to do that. And God required that they lie fallow. And notice how he did it. Verses 3 and 4, Six years thou shalt sow thy field, six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest under the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. Now this matter of letting the land lie fallow is something that my Southland learned to its sorrow is a pretty good business. A great deal of the land in the South for years was planted with cotton every year, year after year, year after year. And what happened? The land was worn out. And a great deal of that land 
They do not believe that it can ever be restored. Well, I think it could. I'm no authority, of course, but I think in time, of course, it would be restored. But the important thing is you wear it out. This was a good agricultural move that God suggested to him. It's quite interesting that God would know all about farming, isn't it? But he seems to have known all about farming. And the sabbatic year now is related, as he makes it clear here, to the land. It couldn't be observed any other place but to the land. And now we find in verses 5 and 7 here, that which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest thou shalt not reap, neither gather the grapes of thy vineyard undressed, for it is a year of rest unto the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you, for thee and for thy servant, for thy maid, for thy hired servant, for thy stranger, that sojourneth with thee, and for thy cattle, and for the beasts that are in thy land, shall all the increase thereof be meat. Now, this is an interesting thing that God did. This shows how the physical needs of the people were supplied during the sabbatic year. The land was so productive that it was not necessary to plant it. We're told that down in the Euphrates Valley in the days of Abraham, it wasn't necessary to plant grain at all. The grain grew without planting. And the ground in Israel produced enough to supply the needs of the owner, his servants, and the stranger. And God would permit, by the way, the poor people to come in during this period and they could get what they wanted to eat. I don't think they were permitted to get any more than that, but they were permitted to get enough to eat. This is a very remarkable way God had of taking care of the poor people. So in the sabbatic year, the man... All he could get was just what he needed to eat. He couldn't use it to market it. This is the year that he's going to feed his family, feed his servants, and the stranger, and the poor people could come in and get theirs. I remember that when I was a pastor of a church in Pasadena, I had a very fine neighbor. He was a Seventh-day Adventist, and he owned a great vineyard over in La Cunada. You couldn't put a vineyard over there today because of the subdivisions that had been put there. But in that day, there were quite a few vineyards up there. And believe me, he had a good one. They grew these fine Concord grapes up there, and there are not too many of them grown in California. And he was a very generous man, a good neighbor, and he'd always bring me a basket or two during the season. And being a Seventh-day Adventist, he had to sort of goad me from time to time. And one day he went after me in earnest. He said to me, why don't you keep the Sabbath day? And I explained to him that I did. But I kept the Sabbath day every day. He said, what day do you keep? And I said, Saturday. And he looked at me in amazement, but I didn't stop there. I said, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then I said, I start all over again. He says, what do you mean? Well, I says, Sabbath today means rest, means redemption rest. You cease from your works and you trust Christ. Well, he didn't want it that way. And he said, I think you ought to keep the Sabbath day just like they did in Israel. Well, I said, are you keeping the Mosaic law? And he assured me he was. And then I gave him this 25th chapter, Leviticus. I told him, I said, in connection with the sabbatic day, there was a sabbatic year. Every seven years was a sabbatic year, and the land would lie fallow. If a man had a vineyard, he is to let the poor people in. Now, I said, you told me that you keep the Mosaic law, and you tell me you keep the Sabbath day, and you think I should keep it. Now, I said, in connection with the Sabbath day, there is a sabbatic year. That year, the poor people can go in and get grapes in the vineyard. Now, I said, you let me know when you're going to observe the sabbatic year and I'll get my basket and come into your vineyard and glean grapes because I said, very frankly, I'm among the poor people and I'd like to come in and get my grapes that year. He said, you better not come in there without my permission. Well, may I say to you, you're not keeping in the Mosaic law. He was keeping a third of it because not only did that belong to it, but also a year of Jubilee belonged to it. And this was God's way, you see, of telling his people that there was a curse on the land and that he never permitted any one of them to hog the land and not let the poor people be taken care of. God was thinking of the land and the poor people at the same time. 
a curse had been put upon the ground. God told Adam, Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And it also speaks of a day that's coming in the future when the curse will be removed. And I say, and Isaiah 35 says, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. You see, all of this had a great spiritual message for the people. And it gave the ground opportunity to re-enrich itself because all of the sustenance was being taken out. This was God's method because the land has never so far been able to support mankind on this earth. And today the fear of a population explosion. Now when the curse is removed, my friends, this ground will produce in a way it's never produced before since the fall of man. Now, after the sabbatic year, there comes another series of sevens. And that series of sevens, you have to go seven sabbatic years. That means every seven years of the sabbatic year. So seven times seven will put you up 49 years. Now, the year after the sabbatic year was the year of Jubilee. And what happened? Verse 8, thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Now, the year of Jubilee was a continuing of the number seven, you see, to the ever-ascending scale of the calendar. It was the largest unit of time, 50 years. You know, today they make a great many of these leases, 50-year lease or a 99-year lease. That is the way that it's done. Well, God worked on that basis also. Seven sabbatic years were numbered, which were 49 years. Then the following year, always the 50th, it was set aside as the year of Jubilee. Now, actually, there were really two years of Jubilee in every century. Now, will you notice verse 9? What was the purpose? Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. Now, why the day of atonement? This actually was the crowning point and period of the entire sabbatical structure of the nation. It was the Shinar Ayobal, the year of jubilee. And it was in many respects the most anticipated and joyful period of the Mosaic economy. The Karen, a Yobel, meant the horn of a ram, and in time the Yobel came to mean trumpet. It's translated 21 times as jubilee, five times as a ram's horn, and once as a trumpet. After Israel was settled in the land, it's difficult to see how one blast of the trumpet a cornet could be heard from Dan to Beersheba. And I think it's reasonable to conclude that in every populated area, there was the simultaneous blowing of the ram's horns to usher in the year of Jubilee. I think it would begin at the temple or at the tabernacle, and then there'd be one station far enough away to hear it, and then it would be passed on and on out to the very end of the land. Now, verse 10, ye shall hallow the 50th year, Proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you. Ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. Now, the thing that happened was this, that you could in that day mortgage your land. But in the year of jubilee, why that land would return back to the original owner. That was the way that God protected the land from ever getting away from the original owner. You could not permanently, if a man mortgaged his land to you, you couldn't permanently take it away from him. Now, you could take it away from him for a period of almost 50 years. But when that jubilee year came, it went right back to him or to his descendants. God protected that. 
Now suppose a man sold himself into slavery. In the year of Jubilee, when that trumpet is sounded, he's free. The shackles are broken. And we are told today to use the same method, to sound the trumpet. Do you know that's what the word proclaim or to herald is? In the New Testament, it's the word caruso, and it means a trumpet. Listen to Paul. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin. You became the servants of righteousness, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6, 17 and 18, and then 23. And listen again, John in 1 John 5, 19 says, And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in the arms of the wicked one, is the way it should be translated. Listen again, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And again he said, If the Son therefore make you free, ye shall be free indeed. The year of Jubilee, everything went free. All mortgages are canceled. And when you come to Jesus Christ, my friend, the sin question is settled. He paid the penalty. It's all settled. And you go free. He makes you free. And again, in Romans 6, 22, Paul says, but now being made free from sin and become servants of God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Romans 6, 22. Romans 8, 21 says, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. There is coming a great jubilee, you see, for the wonderful, wonderful plan and program of God. And you remember yonder when our Lord went into the synagogue in Nazareth. You remember he read in that passage in Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to herald it, to trumpet it, he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable. That's the year of jubilee of the Lord. My, what a wonderful picture that we have here. And there's so much of Scripture that we have on this. And we're told in verses 11 and 12, a jubilee shall that 50th year be unto you. Ye shall not sow, neither reap, that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vineyard, for it's the jubilee, it shall be holy unto you, ye shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. What a wonderful plan and program that was for God, you see, to provide for his people. Then you have the redemption of property. I'll go into that in detail in the book of Ruth when we get there, but notice verses 25. If thy brother be waxen poor, hath sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother so. You see, this is the law of the kinsman redeemer. When a man has lost his property, why, say he does it two years after Jubilee, he'd have to wait 48 more years. Well, it's a long time to wait. If he's got a rich relative, why, that rich relative could redeem him. It'd be wonderful to see that rich uncle of his coming down the highway, taking his checkbook out of his pocket to pay off the mortgage and he could do it. Now, if a man sold himself into slavery, not only do you have the redemption of property, you have the redemption of persons. And in verse 35, and if thy brother be waxen poor and fallen in decay with thee, then thou shalt relieve him, yea, though he be a stranger sojourner, that ye may live with thee. And then, and if thy brother has sold himself, why, in the year of Jubilee, he'd be set free. But of course, suppose that he sold himself to a stranger. What then? Well, this man can come, this rich uncle we told you about can come and redeem his person, redeem the property and the person. You and I have a rich kinsman redeemer. He was rich. He became poor, though, because he shed his precious blood that you and I might be redeemed persons and that he's going to redeem this earth someday. He's already paid the price for it. And it's going to be delivered to him someday. It belongs to him. What a marvelous, marvelous truth we have in this chapter. We leave off there today and we go to the 26th chapter next time. May God richly bless you, my beloved.
Find a resource to complement your study of God's Word at ttb.org or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE if we can help you find what you're looking for. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll meet you back here tomorrow. Jesus made it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Through the Bible is a five-year study of God's entire Word, and together we discover God's purposes in history and our lives, found only when we believe in Jesus Christ. Do you know Him yet?